Am I breaking any kind of laws if I move this out of my way just a little bit? Good evening, everybody. It's good to have you here. Uh, Tammy, my wife, and I drove down this afternoon, and we've been hanging out in the community a little bit, and we live up in the Sacramento area, actually in Roseville. I work at Bayside Church up there, and, and some of you may have come up to the Thrive Conference and stuff, and so if some of you are here, let me say thank you for supporting Thrive and what we're trying to do there, and it's just a privilege to be here. Sacramento is an interesting town. I moved here from Atlanta a couple of years ago, and uh, California state politics... <laughs> I mean, I come from the South, the good old boys. Slap them on the back, shake their hands, buy some okra, eat some grits, it's good. But the other night, I, I, on July 1st, I'm watching the evening news, lead story. State legislature hasn't got a budget yet, and it's costing Californians $52 million a day. And the local news channel's website is keeping a running tab. And so today is the 17th. If we've got any, like, mathematicians in here, you want to multiply 52 million times 17, that's a lot of zeros. It's just like, that's an outrageous number of zeros. And I got to thinking about that, and I got to thought, man, what are some other things going on in our culture today? So you've got the California state government, you've got $52 million a day, that's outrageous. Then you've got the Gulf oil spill going on. And that they can't get that fixed. And for those of you who are very much into protecting the environment, you're thinking, that's just the most outrageous thing. And here's something you may or may not know. The people who are responsible for monitoring offshore drilling and all of that, do you know what they were doing in the weeks leading up to that explosion and stuff? They were surfing porn sites eight hours a day in Washington, D.C. It's outrageous. There's so many outrageous things going on. And so here at Westgate, we've been in this series called Flip. And over the past few weeks, we've been hearing some very radical, some earth-shattering, some profound things from Jesus himself. But the things that Jesus Christ is saying to us tonight, as we come into Matthew chapter 5 and verses 38 through 48, they are nothing short of outrageous and so tonight, we're, we're no longer going to stay in the shallow end of the pool. Tonight, we are moving into the deep waters of faith. So I draw your attention to the screen and kind of follow along with me as I read this passage of Scripture. It says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do you know not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So let me ask you a question. We'll just kind of dive right in tonight. What's your initial gut reaction when somebody humiliates you? Somebody slaps you? Somebody badmouths your kid? What's the first thing that pops into your mind? What is it that you really feel like doing? Some of you may feel like doing something like this. Watch this video clip. This is the Gas Works, an excellent heavy metal bar. Always a babe fest. And they got a food table, too. I'd like to get fine now. Out of my face, you little dweeb.
creep. Now you laugh, but do you know why you laugh? Because every one of us in here can identify with that. At every, in all of our lives, there comes a point in time when we get offended, we get humiliated, we get insulted, and what we want to do is we want to strike back. We want to retaliate. We want to get our sense of retribution. We want to get our revenge. How many of you ever shop on eBay? Yeah, I shop on eBay two, three times a week. And, um, and I was on there a couple years ago, and, and this book caught my eye. It said, Don't Get Mad, Get Even, The Complete Guide to Dirty Tricks. And it began to give some of the chapters, the sample titles. One was called Techniques of Revenge. Another was called Techniques of Harassment. The last chapter in the book was called Make Them Pay. And the bidding started at 1995. Now, the problem with that is, is you can get your revenge. You can get even. But even once you've had your revenge, once you've gotten even, you still haven't gotten rid of the hostility within you. And each time that you do something like that, you just continue the downward spiral. And the hostility gets deeper and deeper. And the problem with that is when you begin to do those kinds of things, then it just begins to escalate each time it happens. I mean, in that movie, do you think that that big guy, once he got up and the stun gun effect went off, you think he didn't grab a couple of other big guys and go back after Garth if, if this was real life? And then Garth would have gotten, he'd have had to go got Wayne and they would have had to gotten a bigger stun gun and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. He said, David, that's just a movie. Yeah, but history tells us the same thing. Think Northern Ireland, Middle East. Think about the Hatfields and McCoys from the Appalachians. Think about the street gangs in every city on the West Coast. What happens is things just continue to grow. Things continue to escalate. And until we deal with them, retaliation's always going to trumpet. And what is it that's going on in our lives and going on that causes us to want to do those kinds of things? You go way on back, even in the Old Testament times, communities there had what was called the blood avenger because he was the kind of guy that if somebody hurt you or a member of your family, then he would go out and he would either take their lives or hurt them back real bad. And so this whole eye for an eye, tooth for tooth thing, that was something that God brought into Old Testament days so that it would at least limit vengeance. So people who accidentally broke your finger or knocked out your eye, you didn't go and take their life or kill their children. It limited vengeance. And then what happened, people began to think, well, you know, it's only a finger, it's only a tooth, it's only an eye. How much will you pay me not to do that to you? And so this became kind of the rule of law. This became the way that they did all of those things throughout years and centuries and generations. And then onto the scene comes the countercultural Jesus. And Jesus says that it's not about retribution, it's not about retaliation, it's all about resolve and it's all about relationship. And Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. He says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. Jeff, come up here. I need you to help me. Oh, great. <laughs> Don't get ahead of him. You're ruining this whole thing. Okay. In biblical days, Jesus used some very specific language. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek. Now, people, here's something you have to understand. People back then, if you were born left-handed, your parents would train you to be right-handed because the left hand was considered unclean. It was considered unholy. You were not allowed to eat with the left hand. You were not allowed to turn the pages of the Torah with the left hand. You were not allowed to work with the left hand. Left hand was considered almost leper-like. And so people always used their right hand for everything, especially in public, so that no one would think badly of them. So Jeff, I want you to take your right hand and be nice, but I want you to slap me on my right cheek. You see what he had to do? He couldn't just like slap me. He had to backhand me. 
Well, being backhanded in public was even more of an insult. Now, I'll finish this. Would you thank Jeff for helping us out this evening? (laughs) What happened then is they had to backhand you. And that was even more insulting because the only people who got backhanded in those days were slaves, wayward children, and unfaithful wives. And so in public, and in that culture, it's all about honor and shame. You, you're being shame-filled because you're getting backhanded. And Jesus says, don't just let them do it there. Stand there and tell them to do the other cheek also. A lady was working in her kitchen And her five-year-old son, Billy, was playing with her little one-year-old toddler in the the family room. And she's in there, and all of a sudden, she hears Billy just scream. And so she yells, Billy, what's happening in there? Now, what's a five-year-old going to say? Nothing. Nothing. How many of y'all have five-year-olds? I'm going to stop right now, pray for you people. And uh, nothing. Billy. Well, the baby and I were playing, and I got close to the baby, and the baby just like pulled my hair, and it hurt. And to be honest with you, Mom, I'm real mad, and I'm thinking about getting this baby back. And she's like, no, Billy, don't do that, because the baby doesn't understand. Dead silence for five seconds. Then the baby screams. (laughs) Billy, what happened? Now he does. (laughs) Jesus would say, don't strike back, don't hit back, don't pull their hair, don't go out and take the Rambo approach where you not only hit them, you hit them harder. Jesus would say, don't do any of that. And the people in the crowd are going, come on, Jesus, this is outrageous. This is the way it's supposed to be. Jesus say, no. You turn the other cheek. And they say, but Jesus, what about the shame? And Jesus, what about the pain? And Jesus, what about people going to think of me? And what I want you to understand, that when Jesus commands us, even today, to turn the other cheek, Jesus is saying this, and this may be the most important thing I'll say to you this weekend, so hear me. Turning the other cheek is not surrendering. Turning the other cheek is not losing. Turning the other cheek is all about God's love strategy for building relationships. And every time you turn the other cheek, that is an investment in God's economy. And I think the Apostle Paul would say amen to that because in Romans chapter 12, look what Paul said. Don't let evil get the best of you, but conquer evil by doing good. But David my business and this economy is having a tough time. And that business owner over there, if he succeeds, that means I might fail. Or what about the salesperson who is your colleague and he did something a little bit shady and this quarter he's getting the bonus that was rightfully yours. What about the spouse, the former spouse who's fighting you for custody of your children? Let's bring it down to Front Street. I'm going to ask you two questions. First time I want to see your hands. Second time, no hands. How many of you in here are married? Okay, put your hands down. Don't raise your hands this time. Just answer it to yourselves. How many of you would say over the years there's occasionally been some tension in your marriage? (laughs) Jesus would say this to us. He say that sometimes when we have those marriage spats, sometimes we say demeaning things and we yell out insults that are are meant to hurt our spouse. Or sometimes we don't do that. We turn our backs, we walk away and we just have this icy silence and we never come back. And Jesus is saying the only way that those demeaning words, the only way that that icy silence is ever going to be broken is when one spouse refuses to engage and instead of returning angry words, instead of returning icy silence, you return love where there is no love. And Jesus is crying out to us at Westgate tonight, I want you to be that spouse. Or maybe you've had a friendship that's gone sideways and there have been some hurtful exchanges And the only way that that, those exchanges are going to stop is when one of the friendships, one of the friends refuses to re-engage in that. And Jesus says, I want you to be that friend. Because in God's economy, relationship and community 
and hope always trump retaliation, ego, and pride. And Jesus has this outrageous attitude towards conflict. And the people are going out there and go, man, this is just crazy. This is outrageous. And then Jesus just keeps right on talking. Jesus says, and we have outrageous attitudes towards our rights. Towards our rights. Check out what Jesus says here. He says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. How, how many of you know the Bible pretty well? In New Testament, Old Testament, how many times is the word pants or jeans mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> See, Jesus has this outrageous thought about the local fashion scene. Because in, and I'm sure that all the, the first century editors of Vogue and GQ and stuff, they wrote about that the following month. Because back then, most people, unless you were very wealthy and lived in a palace, most people had two shirts. And they were kind of those long shirts. Think like um, Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life when he gets up in the middle of the night. And they had those long shirts and you had two of them. And then what you also had was this overcoat or this cloak and you wore it over top of one of your shirts and then at night it also served as your blanket and it's the only garment that you had. And Jesus was saying that if someone comes along and sues you, what they're going to do is they're going to sue you for your shirt and if you owe them a lot, they're going to sue you for both your shirts. But in a court of law, you could not sue someone for his coat or his cloak because they would freeze to death over there in that, on those desert nights. You could only sue for a shirt. And Jesus is so countercultural. He says, when they come to you, I want you to understand that your rights are not as important as the rift between you. I want you to go and say, hey, look, I know I owe you this debt. I'll do anything I can to make it right between us. I'll do anything I can so that you and I can have right relationship. And if that means I have to give you my coat, then here's my coat. And the people are going, that's absurd. If somebody sues you, you sue them back. I mean, if they hit you with a $1 million lawsuit, you slap them with a $10 million counter lawsuit. And Jesus is saying, "Uh uh-uh. Your rights are not as important as healing the rift that exists between you and that person. And Jesus says, if you owe the debt, go to them and make it right. And by this time, this crowd is stunned. This crowd is like, oh, this, this guy's nuts. And I can imagine them sitting there on the hillside. And for the most part, it's very quiet because they're hearing things that they have never heard before in their entire lives. No one has ever told them those kinds of things. And occasionally you could probably hear somebody whisper to some of the people around them, what's this guy going to say next? And what Jesus says next may be the most controversial thing he said all day to his audience there on the mountaintop. Check out what Jesus says to them in verse number 41. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now Jesus is talking primarily to Jewish people there in Palestine. At this time, Palestine was under Roman rule. And they had a, the, the Roman invasion going on. If you would kind of think of some of the news uh, footage you might see of American soldiers walking the streets of cities in Iraq, and kind of Iraq is under American rule right now. And the Palestinians and the Jewish people absolutely hated the Romans. But the Romans were walking the streets and, and sometimes they were walking leisurely and sometimes they were just coming through on their way to battle and the, and the Jewish people would yell insults at them and they would scream at them and they would demean them and in the process they're trying to dehumanize them because they hate Roman soldiers. And so what the Roman law said though is, hey, our soldiers are marching off the battle. They need their energy. And unless they're right in a battle, they're also carrying a backpack that weighs about 85 pounds with all of their various equipment on them. And to save their energy and to try to keep them face, to try to keep them um, energized so when they get to the battle, when they come through your town, they're allowed to come you, pull you out of the crowd and ask you to carry their 85 pound backpack for one mile. And Jesus says, 
It's kind of like a Roman soldier pulls you out of the crowd and asks you to carry his backpack for one mile. And by the way, the Roman law limited it to one mile because they were afraid if they said any more that the Jewish and Palestinian people would throw a revolt. And Jesus says, if they ask you to go and do one mile with them, offer to go two. Take the extra step. Serve where no one has served before. Do those kinds of things. And the people are going, but that's outrageous. No one wants to do that. We hate Rome. And then Jesus just kind of keeps going. He doesn't just stop with serving. Jesus talks about an attitude that we would have towards our possessions. And in the next verse, here's what he says in, in, Rome, in Matthew chapter 5, 42. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. In the United States of America, we like stuff. Our stuff. I know a little bit about this because I married the queen of stuff. On the way over here this afternoon, Tammy and I stopped at Santana Row. Now we have more stuff. <laughs> and God would say, your stuff is not important. It's having a generous spirit towards people in need. See, we have a tendency to want to hold on to things. And we have a tendency to want to possess things. And God has this special place in his heart for needy people, hurting people, downtrodden people, struggling people. And he would say that I want you to be generous with those people. And ultimately he would say, it's not your stuff anyway. God would say that it's his stuff and he's just giving it to you and me, loaning it to you and me for a while to steward it as unto him. And Jesus would say to these people there in the crowds that day, hey, this isn't just about talking, tossing 50 cents in the guitar case when you're down in the mission district. This is about a radical change in your attitude, your approach towards life. This is about turning around and systematically and purposefully and intently living, living a generous lifestyle. Now let me pause right here. This is my first time to worship with you folks here at Westgate, but it's not my first time here, and I have some friends who are part of this church. And I know that this church gets this. I know that this church is very active in compassion type things. I know that this church is very active in working with Compassion International and doing some global things. And I know that this church works with Beautiful Day and there are some things that you do here in the community and because of what you're doing through Beautiful Day, you have captured the imagination of your community and anytime you capture the imagination of the community, you have the greatest opportunity to reach their hearts. And I just wanna say thank you, Westgate for getting this right, as Jesus has taught centuries ago, finally somebody in his name in the 21st century church is getting it. And you know one of the cool things? We, we get some of this right at Bayside occasionally. And one of the coolest things to me, and maybe you can relate, is like if I've been shopping in Target, and I come out of Target, and there's, there's that guy standing there and said, hey, would you like to give a donation and sign this petition to, to help you know, end human trafficking or help build wells over in Uganda? The coolest thing is I can look at them and with all sincerity say, no, I already do that through my church. <laughs> because the world is attracted to genuine servanthood. Now, these four things that we've been talking about for the past few minutes uh, about conflict and about rights and about service and about possessions, these things you and I are not capable of doing on our own. These things have to come about as God transforms us and as God grows us and has his Holy Spirit takes a more prominent place in our lives. We can't do them on our own. And here's what I want you to appreciate. It's not about you and me trying harder and exerting more effort. It's about you and me trusting God more fully and opening our lives up to him more completely. And that's especially important if you and I are going to get this fourth one right because this is a tough one. It was tough for them and it was tough for us. When Jesus talks about having an outrageous attitude towards love, Take a look at what Matthew says about this 
In fact, would you do me a favor? This is so important. I want you to read it with me, if you would. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The reason I ask you to read that with me is because I want you to have those words kind of cemented into your thoughts. Because I want you to appreciate that no other religious leader in all of history has ever so forcefully, so unambiguously commanded his followers to love his enemies. So let me ask you, who are your enemies? Who are your opponents? Who are your adversaries? As I'm asking you this, what faces are running across the screens of your mind? Maybe, maybe it's that neighbor who every weekend throws those outrageous parties. Maybe it's a, a colleague who stole your idea and took credit for it at work. Maybe it's a girlfriend who broke your heart. Maybe it's a father who shattered your self-esteem when you were growing up. And Jesus says, I want you to behave in ways towards them as if you love them. Now, I want you to appreciate this. Jesus is not calling you and me to be doormats for people to trample on. He's not asking us to enable sinful behavior. He's not asking us to put ourselves in positions where our families get harmed or other families get harmed because we didn't take a stand for something. He's not calling us to do that. Jesus is saying, I'm calling you to compete and to compete fairly, but I'm asking you to do it with an attitude of love. You may not genuinely love that person, but I'm not talking about love as an emotion, Jesus would say. I'm talking about love as an attitude. Attitude is your will on purpose. And Jesus is saying, I'm asking you to act in ways that are loving towards them, even though they are not doing so towards you. You say, but... Why? I've been hurt so bad. I've been demeaned so many times. This person has done some things that are extremely inappropriate and I'm genuinely angry. Why should I behave that way? So what if 2,000 years ago Jesus said it? That was then, this is now. What's the big deal? Your questions are legitimate. So let me walk you through just kind of real quick. Five benefits for living with an outrageous attitude. Benefit number one is physical. See, anytime you harbor bitterness and resentment inside you, it becomes a cancer that eats away at your soul and, and, and that, kind of, that kind of produces stress and then stress produces bad health. In fact, the University of North Carolina recently completed a 25-year medical study. And they say people who continually harbor anger and bitterness and resentment have such high stress levels in their lives that they have greater health risk than people who are chronic smokers, overweight, or eat a high-fat diet. And it is in your best interest physically to follow Jesus' teaching here. It's also in your best interest emotionally because if you're harboring anger, you're harboring bitterness, you're harboring hate, you kind of become an angry, bitter, hateful person. You become a product of your own hateful spirit. And I think right here, you've got a few choices. You can nurse it, you can rehearse it, you can curse it, or you can disperse it. You can think about the stuff that happened to you and you can think about how mad you were and you can think about how it's affected you and you can walk through life and your brand new theme song is Nobody Likes Me, Everybody Hates Me, Going to the Garden to Eat Worms. <laughs> or you can rehearse it. You can play it over in your mind again and again and again and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it begins to overwhelm you and it begins to depress you. Or you can curse it. You can think bad thoughts and you can say bad things about that person. You can do all those things, but you still have to deal with you. And Jesus is saying, disperse it. 
let it go. Free yourself emotionally from what other people have done to you that you no longer have control over. Don't give them any more free rent. So you've got a physical benefit and you've got an emotional benefit. If you roll right on down through the next one, you've got the relational benefit. Do you know the kind of people that you and I are drawn to to be friends with? The kind of people we're attracted to? Surveys and all kinds of studies say we're not attracted to people who are funny. We're not drawn to people who are athletic. We don't pursue uh, friendships with people who are pretty. Do you know the kind of people that we are drawn to? People who like us. Think about it. When you overhear somebody out at the soccer field say something nice about your child, instantly there's an affinity you have towards them. When you, when you find out that your boss said something nice about you to a colleague, you feel differently about your boss. You and I are drawn to people who are nice to us. And just on the flip side of that, if you have people in your life who are not nice to you, if you follow God's command and pray for them, it's pretty difficult to genuinely pray for them and harbor ill feelings for them at the same time. There is also a spiritual benefit to this. Sometimes the Bible's very, very clear that if we don't treat people as God's calling us to here, regardless of how they treat us, that kind of begins to hinder, it kind of begins to affect our relationship with God. And people who, who have that kind of difficulty, they have that kind of disconnect, often find that they have troubles resting in God's love for them and God's forgiveness for them. And so the spiritual benefit is for you because until you release that, it's hard for you to genuinely love God and, and receive his love back for you because that always becomes a barrier between you and him. I had the privilege of speaking about three times a month outside of Bayside. And sometimes when I'm speaking, people will come up to me in the lobby and they'll say things to me they won't say to their small group leader or to their pastor because I'm a guest, I'm a safe person. I'm probably not gonna be back there. Well, hopefully I didn't do bad and that's not why I'm coming back, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and so what they'll do is they'll begin telling me about some of their heartaches and some of their troubles and how somebody wounded them and, and frequently it's somebody in their own family or somebody in their own church, somebody very close to them. And then they'll just, I can begin to see it rising. Their necks will get red and their eyes take on a little different glaze. And, and they'll kind of tell me their story and then I'll, when they stop and take a breath, I'll say, so, how long you been holding a grudge? Because I have the spiritual gift of compassion. Because whenever you hold a grudge against someone, it becomes a barrier between you receiving God's love. And so there's that spiritual benefit. And finally, there's a kingdom benefit. See, as you go through life, I mean, it's easy to love people who love you. Anybody can do that. That's natural. And Jesus says, no, love the people who don't love you because Jesus doesn't live in the natural. Jesus lives in the supernatural. And through the power of his Holy Spirit pervading our lives, he's calling you and me to live in the same supernatural realm as he does. And he says, I want you to go out and I want you to be a loving person. I want you to be a giving person. I want you to be a caring person. And the hymn writer said, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to stick a little phrase up on the back of the screen, and here's, here's what I want to do with it. Most likely this week, no one's going to walk up and backhand you in the face. You're probably not going to get sued this week. I'm pretty confident that soldiers aren't going to march down Saratoga Avenue and ask you to carry their backpacks. But there are going to be other opportunities for you this week to live out what Christ is teaching us here tonight. And so as we leave this weekend service and go into the work week, I want you to just be familiar with the little phrase that we're sticking up on the screen. And I want you to be able to have that in the back of your mind. 
And so whenever you come up against one of those situations that might rub you the wrong way, one of those things that might uh, frustrate you and cause you to react in a way that maybe Jesus wouldn't be real proud with, I want you to just be able to say, you know, here's my chance. Here's my chance to swim in the deep end of the pool. Here's my chance to follow Christ's teaching. Here's my chance to allow my heart to be expanded and allow the Holy Spirit to do something more within me. And so here's what I want to do. Uh, at the end of each little scenario, I want you to say that. And so on the count of three, I want us to practice this. Are you ready? One, two, three. Good job. You see, this week you're not probably going to get sued. You're not going to have soldiers pecking you on the shoulder and say, carrying my stuff. But it's entirely possible that this week somebody may ask you for your help. And it's someone that you really don't want to give your help to. And something begins to rise up within you. And then you'll remember from tonight these teachings of Jesus. And deep down within your soul, you can't help it, but you're going to say it anyway. You see, sometimes when we go through life, we have things creep in that we're not even aware of. I have a tendency to sometimes get a little territorial with some of my possessions, especially my books. Because as a pastor over the years, I've developed a pretty good library. And two or three times a week, I'll walk into my office at Bayside, and there'll be a couple of different books going. And I think, man, those youth interns have been up here getting books for college, and I don't know who's got it, and it cost me a lot of money. And I start getting real territorial. And then all of a sudden, I'll get a chance for the God to whisper into my mind that I should no longer see this as an interruption and out of my soul will come the words the same thing is going to happen to you this week somebody's going to come about and and you're going to be in a tight schedule and, and they're going to ask you some things and maybe they're going to ask you for some money or maybe they're not asking you for some money but just in the rat race of life that we get caught up in you're going to be standing there and God's just wanting you to give them five minutes Ask them their name because nobody's asked them their name all week. And to you, immediately, it's going to feel like a real inconvenience. But in the back of your mind, you're going to hear these words and you're going to say, you know, maybe you're running late to work and you're out on the 280 and the traffic's real thick and you're doing your best to get there and you're trying to be a kind driver, but somebody cuts in front of you and and they cut you off and then they flip you off and you're going to say, Yeah, I bet you don't say it with that much gusto. (laughs) Maybe this week, somebody's going to be mean to your kid. Maybe this week, your car's going to be the one that's hit by a drunk driver. Maybe this week, Somebody in your family is going to betray you. And as bad as it hurts, the words of, this, of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5 are going to echo in your mind and you're going to say, do you still see their faces in your mind? The faces that were brought up five minutes ago when I was talking about different scenarios, the faces that made you just a little bit angry, the faces that you asked me those questions and I said they were legitimate questions, do you still see their faces? Do you want to pray for them? Here's your chance. God, tonight we weren't swimming in shallow waters, we were in the deep end of the pool And God, we have norms in our lives. And there are norms in this culture. And just like there were norms of the culture way back when Jesus walked on earth that had been in place for thousands of years, and Jesus came in and he shattered those norms. And because of what he did on the cross, he presented new norms. Initially through his teaching, ultimately through his crucifixion and his resurrection. And God, tonight you're speaking to these people from the words of your son on the Sermon on the Mount. And you're asking them about becoming countercultural, giving up the norms of 21st century Americans and taking on deeper realms of spiritual fortitude and having an attitude that is outrageous when it comes to conflict and it's outrageous when it comes to serving and it's outrageous when it comes to how we love And God, ultimately, you're calling us to do this for our good and your glory. And God, I know that here in just a few moments, we're going to move in 
to communion. And so God, I would pray that um, the people whose faces appeared on the screens of our mind, that for us this evening to receive communion with an open heart and an open mind and open hands and receive the maximum benefit from that, we've got to make the decision, even though living it out may take some effort on your part and ours, we've got to make the decision tonight to be the kind of loving, giving, sharing, serving person that you've called us to. And so God, these folks here are gonna take just a moment and they're going to pray for the person who has persecuted them. They're going to pray for the person who has hurt them.